All right, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to our panel on career pathways, um, where we're gonna be focusing on really coming at the career pathways conversation from a lot of different angles with a, a really robust discussion about what it means to support high quality pathways, what it means to provide credentials of value, um, and what the role state policymakers, business and industry, philanthropy, other partners can play in this. My name is Kate Kramer. I am the Deputy Executive Director of Advanced CTE. We are a national nonprofit that represents state leaders who oversee career and technical education. Um, I'm really honored and excited to moderate today's panel with a really diverse set of perspectives on this issue of career pathways and credentials. Um, I'm gonna give some remarks first, but I'd like to just quickly introduce our panel. You can see their full bios in the app and in the program, but uh, to my immediate left is Danielle Mezra, the former Associate Commissioner in Tennessee, our uh, host state, who oversaw um, college career and technical education and now is doing some consulting uh, to really help scale the work that she started in Tennessee. And she's gonna share really what a, a great state model looks like for taking on this issue and, and taking on um, both quality, but also focusing on access and equity. Um, next to her, we have Matt Spiegelman, who is the, uh, Siegelman, I'm sorry, the CEO of Burning Glass, who's gonna really dig into some great data, tangible data around the skills gap and really explore what that looks like and, and what are some innovative ways we can go about create, using data to actually fill those gaps. Um, next, we have Juan Garcia, the global leader for career advancement at Amazon, who's going to talk about some ways that industry can really lead um, and take on the skills gap from within and think about some innovative ways to support, to, um, support both those within their workforce, but also how do they grow the workforce but bring more into it. And then finally, John Schnur, the CEO of America Achieves who is going to be talking about some other innovative models, particularly at the post-secondary level, talk about the role of philanthropy, has really finally started to stand up and, and pay attention to the, the great issue of career readiness and career pathways. Um, and then we'll open it up for some discussion. So before we turn over to the panel, I'm gonna take the moderator's prerogative and speak for a few minutes and really just talk about why are we having this conversation? What is it, why is career readiness and CT having a moment in time? Just a couple of quick data points. We as an organization uh, put out an annual report where we track state policies and how many states and across issues are actually passing policies. In the past four years, over 500 policies have been passed across all 50 states in DC. This is, this is legislation, state board actions, executive orders, certainly through ESSA and WIOA, we've seen quite a bit of state activity, but this is a tremendous amount of action. Um, we also, earlier this year, saw the House of Representatives unanimously, I'll repeat that, unanimously passed to reauthorize, reauthorize the Carl D. Perkins Career Technical Education Act, the major federal legislation that supports CTE. That is something that does not happen a lot in Washington, D.C., where everyone actually agrees on something, but CT is one of those, those, um, those things. We also uh, recently, a report came out that just looked, tracked all the media mentions of CT and saw that it quadrupled over the past four years. And if you, if you follow these issues like I do, it's not just quadrupled, it's very positive. It's not, there are not, everyone, people often ask us in having organizations saying, what's the downside? What's the other side of the story? And there isn't really one. It is a very positive story right now. Um, so why? Why are we seeing so much activities? And a lot of these themes we'll dig into, especially through the panelists. Uh, first and foremost, I think career, college accreditedness has become the new paradigm. We know that a high school diploma is no longer enough. We need to be preparing kids for life after high school, whatever that may take. But over the past decade, the, that conversation has largely been on the academic side, preparing them with those critical foundational academic skills. And the pendulum has swung back realizing that's insufficient. That's critical but insufficient. And looking at what, is, what would it mean if college was actually part of a pathway to career readiness and that actually is the target we should be trying to reach. Certainly parents are hungering and, and their students are hungry for more real world skills. Everyone who has gone through high school wished that what they learned in high school actually mattered and was relevant. And I think that's even more critical now as we think about as the other issues looking at the, the cost of college, as mentioned earlier today, the debt crisis we have, and some fair conversations about if the four-year degree is really the only opportunity for students. Um, and that's something that I know we'll get into in terms of innovative models on the post-secondary front. Um, 
There's a strong message, uh, one that we've been hearing all day about the, the technological changes, the skills gap, um, which Matt will really dig into. Um, and, and business and industry have really stood up and said, we need to do something, we need to attend to career readiness. We cannot ignore this any longer. Um, as I mentioned, it's politically popular and bipartisan. This is an issue that's a win for many politicians and states. And so they are, it's something they can come together on and work towards together. And that, I think, is another reason we're seeing so much activity. And then finally, and from my perspective most excitingly, is that CTE has been going through a transformation for the past 15 years. We have made a, a lot of effort to move beyond vocational education, terminal programs that are about preparing kids who are not college bound for a job they will stay in for the rest of their lives. It has changed. There has been some great work largely coming from states to focus on quality, to focus on transitions between secondary and post-secondary, to make sure that industry is very involved, to make sure they're anchored in credentials of value. And because we've created this, these quality programs, there is now more demand for that. And so we'll definitely hear Tennessee's story to talk about how you build out that quality system. Um, relatedly, I'm not going to spend time on this, there's good data. We know that CTE works. It keeps kids in schools. They're more likely to graduate. They're less likely to drop out. They're more likely to persist after they leave post-secondary. Um, and parents and students are incredibly satisfied with their opportunities to engage in CTE. It makes school better for them, more relevant, um, and, and more interesting. So here's the big challenge, and what would I, I uh, a number of our speakers will dig into, and I encourage you during your questions to also talk to. Kind of the two big challenges facing, competing and interrelated. Um, one is that we have quality programs, that these are actually meeting the needs of learners and the economy. And that's a tough balance to strike, but it's one that's critical. Um, they need to be, as I've mentioned, anchored in credential value that actually have labor market value, which means we need to actually know what that labor market value is and figure a way to capture the information. Um, and we need to have it be industry-led. They need to be not just at the table, but the ones that are really putting what are those skills, what are those demands, and being part of the opportunities for work-based learning, for curriculum development. Um, and we need to make sure that as we're building these, these these programs, these pathways, that this is where our funding is going and have the courage to phase out those programs that are not meeting the needs of both learners and the economy. Consider this, there are, by some measures, over 5,000 industry credentials on the market today. We have, there is no way of knowing which one of those are really a value and which one of those are nice to have and which one of those are just money makers. So this is a huge issue I know we'll spend some time in it today, but I think this speaks to the challenge we have of this quality conversation. So on the other side, we have this challenge of being, bringing these quality programs to scale. We, CT has a very long history of being islands of excellence. We've always had high quality programs, we've always had those bright stars, but we've also then had a lot of programs we know in our hearts, our legacy programs, our traditional programs, that are very hard for multiple reasons to close down. So as we think about scale, this is both about making sure we only have quality programs and funding them. It also means that we're attending to access challenges in rural communities and commu in populations that both at the secondary and post-secondary level that might have challenges completing these programs um, and figuring out what those supports are. And it also means how do we make sure that industry is part of that scale? Um, it's one thing if you're an Amazon to be able to have something scale, but what about your mom and pops? How do you work this in rural communities to make sure that industry is the table across the board? So here's the good news, more good news, um, is that because of this attention, we've been seeing a lot of support coming from every, kind of every angle in support of Coreddiness and CTE. One um, that we're honored to be a part of is the New Skills for Youth Initiative, funded by J.P. Morgan Chase, us with the Council of Chile School Officers and Education Strategy Group. It's a $35 million investment to work with states to help them transform their CTE, their crew readiness systems. Um, certainly, ESSA, um, we do a kind of an analysis, and we found that 49 states attended to crew readiness in some capacity in their ESSA plans, and 36 through their accountability systems. Um, and certainly, a lot of other organizations, some that I think you would probably recognize um, and then the last piece is that this really will require a lot of innovations, um, whether that's in the design, the delivery, um, especially as we think about reimagining this from the post-secondary angle. So this is, I've teed up some topics. I'm gonna turn it over to our panel to really focus on both kind of these challenges, but what are some of the solutions we're seeing some of the field? So I'm gonna turn it over to Matt to get us started. Thank you so much, and ah, there we go. A little fast on the trigger there. 
Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Uh, Burning Glass is um, privileged to have a really distinctive perspective on what's going on in the job market, on the transition between um, school and career. Uh, and that's because our work involves collecting millions of job postings and resumes every day, analyzing them in order to inform education systems, education institutions, and government agencies on what's going on in the job market, what are the skills that employers expect of graduates, and therefore how can we make more effective transition between education and careers. Um, never has that been a more urgent priority and never has it been more important for us to be really purposeful about how we design those transitions. Um, as you'll see here, um, recent analysis of our data, we find that on the one hand, that jobs on the bottom right, jobs that value college degrees also value uh, experience. Um, and so as a result, relatively few jobs are available to those who actually do go to college. Um, and that's why even in a white hot job market, recent graduates often struggle to get a toehold into the ladder. That's why recent graduates are at home living in mom's attic despite low, historically low rates of unemployment. On the other hand, for those of our students who are going directly from high school uh, to join the workforce, it's why they often suffer a double penalty. One penalty for not having a college degree and another because as they begin to accrue experience, employers don't recognize it and don't pay for it. Um, so when you think about those dual challenges, both for those who complete degrees and those who don't, we can realize the importance of really being purposeful about how we design these transitions. When we think about how education can do a better job of this, one thing in, to, that's important to realize is we've looked at close to a billion job postings over the last 10 years. One of the things that we have come to appreciate is that jobs have a, gen a genome, effectively a DNA. And that DNA is skills. Education teaches skills. Jobs are looking for and are defined by the skills they require. And so we need to start to think increasingly about what skills we provide to our students rather than thinking about specific jobs because the job market changes all the time. One of the ways in which we define that dynamism is by what we've come to call the hybridization of the job market or a hybrid job economy. Here's what I mean by that. You look at jobs today, what we find is that they are increasingly combining sets of skills in ways that we've never seen before. Essentially, jobs are having sex. Here on the left, you're seeing, um, everyone looks so serious. Um, <laughs> you're seeing a very traditional job, welders, right? And so again, we think about the genome of that job. It is a very um, straightforward genome. You, welding jobs require welding skills. We see on the right, jobs increasingly are looking like these mobile app developers. Now, you hear the word developer, you think this is a job that's straight about uh, software. But when you look at actually what employers ask for of those mobile app developers, they're asking for not just programming skills, but also design skills. Um, even marketing skills, of course, soft skills. And so um, when we think about how that aligns with the way that we teach, with the structure of education today, um, there is often a disjoint. Here's a stark example of that around the world of coding skills. We know that coding skills are important for you. We know that kale is good to eat. But um, just look at the far right of this chart. Of jobs in the top earning quartile today. Spot on half are in occupations that have come to value coding skills. Now to be clear, that doesn't mean that, that half of all top earning uh, occupations are tech jobs. They're not. These are jobs in marketing, in finance, in life sciences, and the list goes on from there. But jobs that value coding. Now, by the way, top earning quartile sounds highfalutin. It means you make more than seventy or seventy-five thousand dollars a year. So, if we want our students to have a crack at a middle-class lifestyle in the twenty-first century, there are sets of skills that we need to make sure that they have, um, and that often uh, are orthogonal to the way that we teach today. At the same time, when we tend to think about 
the world of, or the intersection between careers and education, we tend to think about pretty much exclusively vocational skills. And that's a mistake. The core bedrocks of educational experience, the ability to write, to communicate, to work in teams, have never been more valuable. And actually, this is the irony. The more tech-enabled jobs are, the more data-enabled jobs are, the more it turns out they value human skills, the more they value the kinds of things that have always been the mainstays of education. Jobs that are hybr highly hybridized, that are involving those kinds of tech and data skills, um, are 50% more likely, not less, to ask for creativity skills, 50% more likely, not less, to ask for teamwork skills, 50% more likely to ask for problem-solving skills, and, and so on. So we need to make sure that we are thinking about this as a both and, not an either or. We've been talking about a lot of high-skilled jobs here, but this is true across the employment spectrum. Here, looking at the world of middle-skilled jobs, we find that eight and 10 are now digitally intensive. Digitally intensive middle-skilled jobs are growing twice as fast and are twice as likely to pay a living wage. And by the way, those that are not digitally intensive are almost uh, entirely concentrated in construction and transportation. So there's whole swaths of the job market that are closing off to students if we don't provide them um, with sets of skills that didn't used to be part of the way that we would train, that we prepare students. No discussion of how we can prepare students and how we can give them pathways into and through uh, the, wor the world of work is complete if we don't start out by talking about retail because we know that so many students leave high school and go into, even with a high school diploma, and go into uh, a, the sort of the treadmill of low paying retail and service sector jobs. The good news is that when you think about those jobs as a set of skills, there turn out to be a set of skills that are uh, jobs rather that are adjacent that require similar sets of skills in which we can provide those pathways up. Um, and those who make the, those transitions turn out to be a lot less vulnerable to automation and make significant gains uh, from an income mobility perspective. Um, looking at those retail workers, you might think, well, some of this sounds kind of nice, but maybe it's improbable. And so we looked at literally um, tens of millions of resumes of people who started out in retail, and where did they go on to? Um, and have highlighted some um, what I'll call opportunity pathways for retail workers. You may think it seems improbable to think of IT careers as a pathway from uh, retail. But if you are selling consumer electronics at Best Buy, it's not a big step to move to servicing consumer electronics on their geek squad and to go from there to a help desk job, um, which is sort of a golden gateway. And, and by the way, both to income mobility and again to significantly reduced automation vulnerability. Good example of how people can make those transitions and how can develop those pathways is around supervisory skills. We know that overall, um, for even in something like food service, very low skill area, adding supervisory skills carries a $10,000 pay premium. That's life changing. If you're an auto mechanic, um, ASE Tech supervisors make 50% more than ASE Techs, right? So there are sets of skills. When we think about boot camps, we don't need to think about this as coding boot camps. Um, there are sets of skills like supervisory skills, which become important. By the way, uh, middle skill workers are actually more likely to be managers, to be truly managers than MBAs. Here's the problem. Increasingly, those supervisory jobs are closing off to middle skill workers. Um, here's an analysis of degree requirements in a range of middle skill supervisory positions. Take a look at those production supervisors over there. Only 16% of production supervisors have a college degree. 73% um, of job postings for production supervisors ask for one. Um, that's a huge gap. And so it speaks to the need to create alternative currency to help validate that people have the skills that make them ready to make them work ready. Certifications can be one of those kinds of mechanisms. Here's an example, excuse me, of HR and the ways that certifications can help people move up in the world of HR. But here's the problem. Um, 
As we heard, there are thousands of industry credentials and certifications today. We track demand for 2,500 certifications. 10% um, of all jobs outside of healthcare ask for one. Um, so millions of jobs ask for certifications. And yet, of those that do, two thirds are asking for one of the top 50 out of 2,500. 90% ask for one of the top 200. So there's already a huge long tail of certifications that have no currency with employers. And we think about um, alternative credentials, we need to really think about how we invest them with currency with employer community. Apprenticeships can be another one of those pathways. Um, and actually, this is, a, uh, this is pulled from a report we just released this morning uh, in partnership with Harvard Business School, looking at the potential to expand apprenticeships. Apprenticeships are another one of those kinds of areas where there's broad bipartisan support for apprenticeship, but what does that actually mean? If we really want to expand apprenticeship, that means not just expanding um, opportunities in the same 27 predominantly union trades that dominate the apprenticeship landscape today. And when you can actually think about a broader set of jobs as being apprenticeable that um, might actually, God forbid, have some upward mobility, um, you actually wind up creating an eightfold increase in the span of um, potential apprenticeships, threefold number of occupations that could be served by them. But most importantly, as you'll see here on the right, as you grow the world of apprenticeships, you also are growing the world of upward mobility. Today, if you apprentice to be a glazier, you will be a window repairer for the rest of your career. Um, there is some of the, the expanded groups of apprenticeships have a six-fold increase in mobility. Here's the thing, though. Degrees still matter, and they matter a lot. But it also matters which one. And we tend to focus this discussion today on just, hey, how do we get students to go and get a degree and complete? That's great, but we need to think about which ones. And here, focused on the world of community college students, 58%, um, uh, almost 6 in 10 community college students, are currently enrolled in a transfer degree program, or what they call it, something like an associates in liberal arts or associates in general studies. Of those, of students who are in associates programs, only 9% will go on and complete a four-year degree in any reasonable amount of time. What they come out with is a degree, an associate, a transfer degree that is no job market currency. Just to put that in perspective, if you look in the state of Texas as just one example, and you compare associates of arts, so again, transfer degree, with practical uh, associate degrees, on average, that's a $17,000 difference in pay uh, on uh, five years out. That's huge. And by the way, a 24-fold difference in the number of jobs that ask for those. This is true not only then in degrees themselves, but this need to be more focused and provide more empowerment to students to make smarter decisions is throughout. It's true for interns in both two- and four-year programs. Um, we're all used to thinking back when we all went through school, internship was kind of where you accrued skills. Today, one of the things that strikes me is across hundreds of thousands of internship postings, internships turn out to be, uh, to have significant skill requirements going in. So we need to make sure that we are empowering students with the skills they're going to need to get the internship that gets them the job. And it's true on graduation as well. There are sets of last mile skills that make huge differences, both the high school level and the college level, excuse me, in people's earning potential. A liberal arts student who learns graphic design unlocks 135,000 extra jobs and a $9,000 pay premium. And you can see there's a whole bunch of other skills that do the same. And that's true throughout people's careers as well. In a hybrid job market, where jobs are constantly changing. We need to give people the pathways to accrue new skills as they go along. And that's true at all swaths of employment, from the admin who's making $32,000 and could be making $40,000 if she knew Salesforce.com, to a graphic designer who's making $54,000, be making over seventy dollars if she knew HTML5. These are opportunities for people, unique opportunities for people to arbitrage in themselves. We need to empower people with the information that helps them see those opportunities and the infrastructure to do it. Thanks so much. Looking forward to this conversation.
have you go next and share some of your work. Up to you. That's all right. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Juan Garcia. I'm with a scrappy little startup called Amazon you may have heard of. Uh, I used to be a, uh, uh, a Navy pilot, a naval aviator, as my kids like to say, a nasal radiator. And I love to fly. But the best part of my service was uh, seeing young men and women earn a place at the American table with the GI Bill. Uh, so as I wrapped up my service and Amazon approached with this idea that sounded a lot to me like a GI Bill without the GI, I wanted to learn more. Lots of companies have innovative tuition assistance programs. We think ours is a little peculiar and a little different. And let me put a face on it with a very short little video clip. Uh, Kane, if you would. So I think many, more and more companies across America are offering increasingly generous tuition assistance programs, which is awesome. But I think if you surveyed into them, what you'd find is that they tend to be uh, focused at the white collar uh, exempt workforce. They tend to double as retention devices. Think MBAs, uh, graduate degrees. Amazon doesn't have a tuition assistance program for our management, for our exempt white collar workforce. Career choice is available exclusively for our hourly workforce. Uh, the second piece is this. We, as Sherry alluded to, we front pay. No one uh, uh, is asked to reach into their pocket for a dollar, even if they're confident for uh, prompt reimbursement. We know that for adult learners with complicated lives, that's a lot to ask for. But the real secret sauce of Amazon's career choice and why we evangelize about this so much is, is not the mechanics. Mechanics are pretty straightforward. Every hourly worker upon reaching a one-year tenure mark is eligible. That's the loan criteria. It's 95% of all books, tuition, and fees, up to $3,000 a year, times four, 12,000. What really we think makes it peculiar is we like to say we do the homework in advance, meaning twice a year in every geographic node where there's a significant Amazon footprint, we conduct uh, labor market studies to determine what the most in-demand roles will be in your community, in your town. We, par we partner with the Department of Labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics to do this. And then we offer curriculum, courses of study, exclusively in those roles. So there's no kind of exploring your intellectual curiosity. This is to get degrees and certifications 
in the most in-demand roles in your town. Which leads to the, you know, the obvious question, uh, let me get this straight, Amazon, you're training people, you're paying for them to leave. Which is not the traditional model, right? Uh, typically, uh, uh, big manufacturers, companies, would train folks, invest in them, and hope to keep them for a career. But no, that's exactly what we're doing. And not only are, are we training them to leave, we're trying to remove every barrier to, in doing so. We think it's an acknowledgement and the reality that if you believe what the demographers say, the traditional model where mostly our fathers back then would spend an entire 40, 50 year career with a single company and have the proverbial gold watch at the end, well, it doesn't happen like that very much anymore. This generation is much more likely to have six to eight stops across their personal and professional journey. We want to acknowledge that, we want to facilitate that in a way that's good for them, good for business, and ultimately, we think is uh, we build an ecosystem out across the country and across the world. We do this in 10 countries. How committed is Amazon and Jeff Bezos to this? A very, very quick anecdote. Those of you who spend time in the tech world or, 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 or work there know that there's an annual gathering called Recode. This is where the V world's tech titans meet at a resort somewhere, and one per year takes a turn laying out their big vision, their idea for the decade to come. And to give you a sense of the scale, at Recode the year before last, it was Larry Page from Google's turn. And if you don't remember the name, you remember the concept. That's where he laid out Google's initiative they call Project Loon, the effort to wire, to provide Wi-Fi for the continent of Africa by floating these giant dirigibles, these giant balloons, because much of sub-Saharan Africa doesn't have the traditional infrastructure with telephone towers and, and TV signals. So that's the scale of idea that gets dropped at Recode, wiring a continent. So last year, when it was Jeff Bezos from Amazon's turn, it was a whole cottage industry that speculates about what the, what the idea would be. Would it be the latest gadget or drone deliveries or so forth? Jeff thought about it and said, no, I want to use Recode this year to tell the world we're open sourcing career choice. There is no catch. There is no hook. There is no cost. We think this is the future of the American workforce and a pipelined education, and we want to share it with any company big, large-scale manufacturers like us, or small mom-and-pop outfits. My favorite one is a little uh, outfit down in San Diego, California that does surf lessons, um, take people out for surf trips. But the young man who runs it said he's got a little call center right there in the office at the beach where people call in and book their vacations and their trips. And it occurred to him in learning about career choice, he said, hey, this is going to help me recruit a better candidate. They're going to be more engaged while they're working for me, and they're not going to quit if they're pursuing a degree that I'm helping subsidize. So they do career choice right there in that little call center in the office by the beach. In every Amazon, uh, we call them fulfillment centers, large work, work, where, uh, warehouses with over a 1,000 associates, the very first thing you'll see when you walk in, as soon as you pass the turnstiles, is a large paint branded career choice classroom built fishbowl style, glass walls. And the idea is that at least twice a day, at least twice a day, Every associate has to walk past that thing on their way in and on their way out and see their peers take advantage of this program and say, hey, how come I'm not doing the same? So it's an acknowledgment that for people working a 10-hour you know, shift to then go pick up a child at daycare and try to make the other one soccer practice and then race across town to park and to make class at a community college seems like a heavy lift. So we brought those faculty to their workplace. These are community college faculties. These are vocational training uh, instructors. We schedule the classes before and after shifts, uh, and especially for adult learners who may or may not have been in a classroom for 5, 10, 15 years, what we're learning is that um, taking that psychological chasm, taking that step across that chasm back into a learning environment, they are much more likely to do so if it's in the comfort of their workplace, surrounded by their peers, in a place that fits their schedule. We think it's the future. We're committed to it, and I look forward to having the conversation. Thanks. Thank you. That is, we're going to dig into that definitely. Right. It's a really innovative model um, and, and one that shows that this can be industry led and uh, good opportunities for industry to lean in. Um, we're going to move now to John um, to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. <laughs> so I'm um, it's so impressive. I mean, I, I know we'll come back to this, but I really have been learning about the career choice model. And I think that um, before I share some comments, I just want to say I think that um, one of the huge needs and opportunities is for employers to step up in a big way both programmatically, but also in terms of signaling about what kind of um, uh, focus is needed. Um, I think one of the big challenges we've got in focusing on skills and jobs in the US 
in terms of pathways that don't always involve four-year degrees is that four-year degrees right now, for some good reason, are a proxy for um, opportunity in this country. People think, huh, I got a four-year degree, and that's gonna give me opportunity. Um, and there's a place for that. We need to continue to increase and diversify who has access to really good four-year degree programs, and it's absolutely critical. At the same time, only 30% of people in this country get four-year degrees right now in the low 30s. Um, uh, substantial majority enter, but only 30% complete. So um, right now we have no, um, for the most part, no scalable pathway into good jobs, for the most part at scale, into good jobs that require beyond high school education and at least initially less than four-year college. And there's a little bit of chicken and egg issue because when, and I'll get back to why I think the Amazon work is so important in this, um, is when you create programs that are trying to solve for this right now, um, and we at America Achieves and partners with Bloomberg Philanthropies, we've got Bloomberg funding supporting some cutting edge youth apprenticeship work in Colorado, for example, you may have heard about, called CareerWise, which is adapting the European apprenticeship model in Denver um, to high-end um, finance, healthcare, IT jobs, or North Carolina Siemens has been backing some really important apprenticeships in North Carolina, um, in South Carolina, for example. Um, those are just examples. But even when you get programs in place right now, you actually have, we've seen this on the ground, um, students and families often not wanting to go into those routes because they're seen as suboptimal compared to um, going to four-year college. And even the way those have to get sold in the end are, hey, this is a way of actually being a pathway to a four-year degree. Um, but um, people want four-year college as a kind of a, as a, a it's just an American almost aspiration for kind of being a proxy for opportunity. So when you build the programs, without the kind of dignity of work and pathway across different pathways, people don't want them. At the same time, when you actually just say, hey, this is important, but you actually don't have, if you say to people in communities, oh, you know what, four-year college is not necessary for everyone, you should pursue something else. In a lot of places around the country, you actually don't have the pathways that actually, in fact, lead tangibly to high quality jobs and careers. You can say that, but what that inevitably means is you have the people often lower and moderate income, often people of color, often who've been shut out more from the American dream, who actually wind up not having tangible pathways to a good job. So there's a bit of chicken and egg. How do you both have the pathways getting built that are actual tangible programmatic pathways to good jobs? And how do you actually shift people in this country's um, leverage our incredible sense of desire to have opportunity for everyone, but seeing that there are actually multiple pathways to get there, not for your college, doing it at the same time is key. And I'll come back to the Amazon piece, because I think that without actually cracking this code on what people value in this country, opportunity is right, but there's just a mistake about what the various pathways to that opportunity are. We're not going to succeed. So branding a different kind of pathway is critical, and I think there's no better brand to leverage that students and families care about than good jobs and attractive companies with good brands like Amazon. So for me, I mean, programmatically, I think career-wise is a great model. I think there's some exciting opportunities and challenges. I get more employers to do that and the role for technical community colleges. And you may want to talk about that because I think it's a really cool opportunity to scale that. But to me, the idea that Jeff Bezos made this the number one focus last year at Recode and said, this is the issue. P pathways to high demand jobs. This is what you need and kind of even to be get opportunity and in a way be cool in this country. And to what you described, to have um, the classrooms that everyone has to walk by and say, wow, this is actually what's great, what's, what's needed. You're actually, like, I think, helping to leverage one of the most powerful brands in the country that um, represent a broader sense of opportunity and agility and innovation to say, you know what? We do deeply believe in opportunity. And yes, for some, that's four-year college pathway. But for some, that's pathways to good jobs that involve other pathways. And so I think what Amazon, you've started, is just an incredibly like mm, powerful seed what we need more, more in the country. And I think we don't fat, crack, crack that, no matter what models you look at, and I'll spend a couple minutes talking about some other models globally we've looked at and what the implications are here. There's a Swiss model that's really impressive. I'll talk about that for a minute. There's a Singapore model that's really impressive. Um, but if we don't adapt it to the US in a way that can actually tap into kind of our American aspiration for opportunity the way we see that, none of those models or systems are gonna work. And so that's why I think the Amazon piece is really important. Let me say a few other things just as, uh, as context. Um, I think the, um, as spent time looking at this for the last several years and spent a lot of time in education over the last 20 years looking at opportunities and challenges. Um, uh, it seems to me that this issue is like the issue of our time, and here's why. Um, I think the context is that we have the most rapidly changing economy and workforce in global history. It's probably the most significant shifts, but it's certainly the most ongoing, um, fastest pace of change in global history. 
And the question, I think, across institutions, education, media, democracy, employment, is how do you adapt different institutions to this pace of change, largely driven by technology, largely driven by automation, largely driven by different um, um, technologies. But the workforce is changing so fast on an ongoing way because of that. And the bar that then is created because of that changed workforce for skills is not only dramatically different than it was 30 years ago, but the pace of change now is unlike anything we've ever seen. So the question, how do you adapt education? How do you create in this, in this fluid, rapidly changing environment, economy, technology-driven changes of work, how do you create an education to employment system in this country that matches this kind of um, fast pace of change, I think is, is the essential challenge for education, um, which is different than the kind of challenge we've had before, and just a little context on that. In 1973, um, one in four US jobs required post-secondary education, one in four. A high school degree was the ticket to a middle class job and a middle class lifestyle. Therefore, the education employment system was getting across the stage to get a diploma. And if you did, you basically had a shot at a middle class job and career. And that was kind of a good, that was a good system. And the challenge was highly inequitable. But then there was a lot of focus on getting a lot more access to a high school degree. Today, let me give you two pieces of data, one national and one Tennessee data to underscore, I know we know this, but how, how um, seismically we've already shifted. Um, uh, Tony Carnevale's shop at Georgetown put out a report that some of you uh, may have seen that looked at good jobs, create good new jobs created since 2010. Um, and of the good new jobs created since 2010, at least $45,000 salary with benefits, over 98% of those good new jobs required post-secondary education of some kind. So no longer is a high school ticket a degree to middle, a ticket to a middle class job. Now, some of those are four-year degrees, for sure. And again, there's a very crucial place for four-year degrees. And in my view, there is a, too much of a backlash right now that we're seeing against. I think we need to kind of have more balance, but there's too much of a backlash. There's a huge role for those institutions that are strong four-year degree programs, opening up access to students from all backgrounds, for sure. But that said, a lot of those jobs, those good new jobs, are jobs that require degrees and certificates that are short of four-year degrees. Um, they are in healthcare, in information technology, in advanced manufacturing, in logistics. Um, and right now, we have this new bar that's higher than high school degree, that's often short of a four-year degree. The high school ticket is no, high school degree is no longer a middle-class job, and we haven't adapted how do you create an education for employment system to that new reality given that economic change. One other piece of data I'll share with you from a Tennessee perspective, and Danielle can elaborate on this, but to me this is, we're here, and it's kind of stunning data. It's not atypical. Um, uh, but and Danielle, make, if I'm wrong by a couple of percentage points, you should correct me, but in Tennessee, for students who graduated from Tennessee uh, high school only in 2010, without any other post-secondary education, um, you look at what they were earning four to five years later. The average earnings were roughly around $8,500 a year um, if they just had a high school degree. $8,500. What used to be the ticket to a middle-class job is now getting $8,000 to $8,500 a year. And if I think, if I understand right, I think it's like something like 80%, 82% are on minimum wage or less jobs. Um, um, and that's the only 18% or above that. So you have this seismic shift, and I think the challenge that we're facing, which is why I think this is the issue of our, of our time, is how do you adapt education to create an education deployment system that adapts to that new reality of where the jobs are? And I, I won't go in depth on it, I'm happy to in Q&A. I will say there are some models of this that are not the right models for the US, but have solved this. And the one I would point out, and I think Switzerland and Singapore are two of the most interesting. Again, they're not the mo models for us. But I'll just very close briefly by telling you about the Swiss model and just tell you what, like, what's, what's relevant about that, what needs to be changed. And, but I think this, at the local state level, to me, is what's the American version of this? In Switzerland, they've, over the last 30 years, created a dual system of education, basically, where they have um, uh, education and work-based learning starting at age 15. And 70% of the young people go through apprenticeships, um, which often gets focus on, but that's not necessarily the only important piece of the system. And, but there's an articulation for people who go through apprenticeships or go through regular high schools into good jobs and economic opportunity of all time, of all, of all kinds. And there's flexibility. So you can go actually one third of the apprentices wind up going to college. So you have different pathways that go to drug a job, you can change along the way. But there's kind of articulated pathways that go, whether you're an apprentice, whether you're in high school, that link up to different types of post-secondary degrees, most of which then are linked to good jobs that actually employers value say, wow, these are actually the competencies we need for good jobs. And there's a variety of pathways for all kids that lead to that. It's not a one company play. It's kind of a system-wide play where there's a growing pool of workers that are available for employers and systemic opportunities for youth in order to choose that. 
again, Switzerland's not the right model for us in many ways. What they've got right is they actually have a primacy, kind of a dignity of work of all kinds. They have employers driving this in big ways. They've got intermediaries that pull off the kind of complicated cross-sector work needed across employers and community colleges, basically, and high schools and, and others. Um, they have a lot of other things right. But for us, it's not going to work that way. Number one, we want to only they track more than we would want to. We want to open up, capitalize on talent across all backgrounds. We want to be more agile than they are. Even the Swiss say, you know what, in this changing economy, their system may be too rigid. Given how fast jobs are changing, that system may not be the right one for a, a, change, a rapidly changing economy. And third, it still isn't, given the apprenticeship work focus, it's still not capitalizing on a way that would make American youth and families want to kind of opt in. We need a version of that. So Switzerland's not the right model, but I think that at the local state level, and I'll close on this, they're promising programs. You can talk about apprenticeship programs, community technical colleges that are focused on jobs and careers, uh, changed employer, employer hiring practices that are more linked to good jobs. And there's promising examples of kinds of we've invested philanthropically in some of those. But the challenge at the local and state level is how do you, as a set of employers, I think probably a governor in many cases, how do you pull together employers to reinvent the way they do business, community college, technical college the way they do business, High school is the way to do business in a way that matches what is being described cogently to the public as an opportunity and create a, a lo local American versions of what Switzerland and Singapore do. I think unless we actually leverage all those different program components and leaders at the local and state level, we won't get there. I think the cool opportunity is all across this country, I think there's an opportunity for leadership and innovation at the local and state level to help figure this out. And I think this is going to be like a 10 to 20 year field to figure this out. And hopefully, we're, who knows who's going to succeed the most, which places first. But whoever succeeds first at the community state level, I think will create models that I think will help us as a country get there over the next 20 years. All right, well, we're now going to thank you all for your remarks. We're going to circle back. I'm now going to turn it to Danielle, who is going to talk about what might be a great model um, for how you really start from scratch and build out a statewide vision and put career pathways first. So I'm going to. I thought it'd be a little bit different, come back up to the, the podium. But um, it, I'm glad that I had a chance to, to kind, of, um, kind of bring up the rear here of this panel. Um, be, largely because the conversations um, that, that we had, the listenings that we just had, really is a reflection of all of our communities. We have amazing uh, 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 companies and organizations who help crunch the numbers to, to help individuals like myself better understand what is what is asked and what is not asked. We have amazing companies like Amazon who, who understand that they have an obligation to grow, grow up their own. Um, and we have amazing policymakers and funders who, who look across the landscape and the horizon and they see, they see what's around the bend. My, my role um, here on this panel, the way I have uh, interpreted this, is really to help um, come around and bring a face back to what does all this mean, particularly for, for government, local, state, the individuals who, at the end of the day, are the ones who, who work and are responsible for helping to shepherd through that next generation, or to strengthen a community um, and understand what the mechanics are that require that strengthening. My, my background um, is, is one at both the local and state level. I served two mayors in metropolitan area as the chief education strategist. And during that time, I saw very clearly and in my face too often the role of education in the strengthening and the movement of a solid community or economic base. No better way to understand whether your city, your town, your community is strong or not than to listen to the individuals, the employers, the community leaders who are telling you education is not getting it done do something about it. What does that mean? I've come to realize, both at the local level and at the state level, when I was honored to become the Assistant Commissioner for the State of Tennessee on College Career and Technical Education, that for local and state government, 
the way in which they approach education either becomes the barrier or the catalyst for what is so desperately desired by an employer, by a civic-minded individual, by someone who doesn't want to see their tax base go lower or their standard of living diminish such that all of a sudden their, their home price is less than what they paid for. And so for individuals, uh, show of hands, anybody who's in government or is responsible for education in their state, in their community, anybody? Okay, a few hands. It's a big responsibility. But part of that, understanding that responsibility, is beginning to kind of break apart that marriage of education to industry. When I came to the state uh, in Tennessee about, now it would be six years ago, I had one goal in mind, was to, to very much bridge the gap between the needs of my state at that state level, that regional level, that local level, and what my responsibilities were around career and technical education, which is the primary gateway and driver when we talk about career pathways. When we talk about gearing up that next generation with regard to the technical skills, the academic skills, the employability skills that were already mentioned, career and technical education as the arm of public education at the secondary and post-secondary levels is that driving force, but too often that has not been something necessarily that states have really talked about. Not really talked about. They mention it, legislations are passed, but at the end of the day, what is actually under the hood is really is the determinant as to the quality of the product, product being in this case a learner who's graduating either from high school or post-secondary with a credential, and that quality of product leading actually to meeting the needs of an employer, meeting the needs of a community. And so when I joined the state six years ago now, my focus was very simple, and this came from the roots of that local government experience that I had, is that there has to be vertical, real vertical alignment between secondary or K-12 education, post-secondary, and occupation, essentially education and industry, that that weaving between the two is a must. If we are not able to do it on our end, then the backs of that labor do rest with an Amazon or another entity who says, all right, I will take that on and I will do that. So what does that really then mean? So if I came in and said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix education here in Tennessee around Korean education, what did that mean from this perspective? And what I quickly learned is that program titles don't fix things. If you match a program title to an occupation and you don't look under the hood, you didn't change anything for that community, for that state. And so you have to begin to unpack the way in which you think about the rolling out of your education, your policies, your programs how they weave into the labor and economic needs and opportunities of your state, and the role of K-12 and post-secondary together to frame out that continuum of learning that is necessary. So just some quick things, um, and, then, and then I will um, allow for the questionings to take place. Um, is that most importantly for states, for local governments, is that you have to create the conditions to allow for the reform to take place. You have to be able to understand your data, to understand your needs, to understand where you are as an entity in the delivery of those to meet the real needs that your, that your state, that your local community has. And so there are what I call non-negotiables. We talk about non-negotiables um, quite a bit, but non-negotiables uh, was a term that I used pretty immediately with my staff, along with the word dead end, is that we cannot be a producer of dead ends for our students. 
And so we must look at what are non-negotiables, lines in the sand that we will not deviate from as we reform career and technical education for the state of Tennessee. I'm just gonna read a few things and then I'm gonna talk about just um, a, another little section. And so what I meant by non-negotiables is again, not simply looking at a program of study and, and looking at what courses are there and simply changing the title to match the need or the economic or labor needs of the company or the, the state. Rather, to look at it more intently. What are your course sequencings that are progressive for a student to continue to learn? What are your course standards? Are those standards robust to meet the technical, the academic, and the employability skills that are necessary that employer has voiced to you? The vertical alignment to post-secondary is essential. If you're out of alignment with post-secondary, then you are not educating, you're not moving through that next generation for your state and for your community. Strong wraparounds are also essential. Work-based learning, the ability to qualify for and sit an industry certification as a capstone for that student at that secondary level is your sequencing such that allows for that student to be successful. There are other sets of negotiations or non-negotiables that I have in place, but probably the most important thing for state um, government uh, folks is the ability to be brave enough to make the hard decisions that are gonna be made when you talk about reforming, particularly reforming in areas that are so essential to the fabric and vitality of your state. And brave enough means to be able to retire misaligned pathways, courses, standards that no longer match with what's happening in your state. Brave enough to reprioritize your funding to influence behavior and decision making so that the movement of what you know needs to be in place for your state, you begin to see it operationalize at that local level with their districts. Be brave enough to reframe how you report student success by going after strong student outcomes with robust data fields. Being brave enough to be transparent with your decision making and processes, communications, going on the road and taking very much the arrows that will come your way as you talk through what may eventually be a change for someone who's being impacted by your decision making. And being brave enough to engage your critical stakeholders to inform and confirm your efforts. That's working with employers, that's working with other state agencies to get that necessary buy-in that's necessary to again drive the change that you wanna see. Um, I, will stop, I will stop here, but um, I, I, I will leave with this though, is that all of our conversations, though we come from very different backgrounds, are exceedingly interconnected with one another. And if we fail to interconnect, if we fail to buy and marry into each other's efforts and conversations, then we will always be not a three-legged stool, but a two-legged or a one-legged. And we wonder why we're not able to stand on our own. This is why. So I will, I will kind of leave there and hopefully we'll have some great conversations that will tie that all back together. Well, thank you all. I definitely want to make sure we leave plenty of time from questions for you, but I have one question I'm going to ask now, and then um, we were encouraged this morning to steal, and so I'm going to steal an idea in a previous session and plan to come back and end the session with a rapid fire where I'm going to ask you one piece of advice and one caution for the room, so heads up. But my question now is really around data. I mean, we started this panel by digging into um, some of the data of what job postings, what, what skills are required. Um, data is certainly part of the conversation at Amazon in terms of what programs should we, we be doing. I know at Tennessee, a lot of your story started by looking at the data and saying, we're failing these kids. And so there's so much data. We're going to have even more data as now more and more states are tending to these issues through their ESSA plans. Um, as if Perkins ever gets reauthorized. So I guess the question is, where should those in the audience, where should we start with the data? How do you start that conversation? What's the most important element? Um, and how do we make it clear? Because there's a lot of it, it's confusing, it's, it can be very wonky, very technical, but we know it's so critical to underpin all of these pathways. I'll take a shot of that. As uh, in what may be the most uh, uh, data-driven company that I'm aware of, uh, every aspect of our program is 
is weighed and measured and assessed. And you alluded to the, uh, the course offerings, and I, I think I mentioned that before. Those course, course offerings vary geographically. Again, it's all based on what the most in-demand roles are in your town. So if you're from South Texas, where I'm from, it might be uh, welding as a chief offering where uh, the petrochemical industry is, is moving out from the storms and, and they always have a, a high demand for that. In the Pacific Northwest, uh, where Boeing and other large aircraft manufacturers are, DFW it might be AMTP, getting their aircraft mechanics um, certification. Other parts in the country, uh, IT, healthcare, CDL. So that's one piece of it. We're also, I mentioned uh, Amazon's got a pretty sophisticated way of measuring engagement. So we know that those folks who are taking advantage of the program uh, are, their engagement levels spike relative to those who, uh, who are not. And then we also measure uh, on the recruiting end. We, uh, we hire using a cultural assessment that's scored very carefully. And we know in those pockets and those communities where we've advertised and made career choice a focus of the recruiting effort, those scores, those scores are going to come in higher uh, on the cultural assessment because these are folks who are uh, not seeing this opportunity as necessarily a, a career, packing and stowing boxes, but as a pathway to their, uh, their ultimate goal or aspiration. I'm curious, Matt, I mean, what's your advice on and how do you use, right, what, what, is, what is a state policymaker, what is an advocate supposed to do, right, with all this really meaningful, rich data to actually inform policy to make the right decisions? Well, um, John talked before about the importance of signaling. Um, and essentially, when you think about the job market, it is what engineers would like to call a signal processing problem. Um, employers, it's not that there are no signals in the job market. Employers are sending millions of signals a day in terms of the kinds of jobs that they're putting out there. Um, job seekers are sending out millions of signals in terms of their job applications and the like. What we often lack for those of us who are job market participants, either as employers, as learners, um, or as intermediaries in policy, is the vocabulary to actually see what's, to be able to aggregate up those signals and to see what's going on. And so focusing on getting the vocabulary to the right level of granularity that it is both, that it's actionable, but it's not so granular that, you know, it's just kind of a, a, a mush, um, is a really important part of this. And a lot of um, the focus that we put in is, is on exactly that question. Um, because, and that's why I sort of talked before about this notion of looking about at the genome of jobs. We're used to thinking about, um, it, you know, we're starting to, to, to think about um, demand-driven frames, and that's important, but it's probably not enough. Because when we think about occup demand data, that tends to be reported at broad occupational levels. Um, the BLS, for example, reports demand for what's, uh, for, for a job called a computer programmer. Um, I, for the life of me, still don't know what a computer programmer is. Um, you know, there are Ruby developers, there are PHP developers, there's, so we need to get to a level of data that allows us to be actionable, and that data and that actionability happens at the granularity of skills. When we can see that, we can then formulate um, actionable policies around how to help people um, see where the opportunities are to see the opportunities to enter and what are the specific skills that are going to make them successful in making that entrance and um, so that they can see the skills that are going to allow them to move up. And I'm curious, John, I mean, you're, you're here wearing multiple hats, America Cheese, but also um, your work with Bloomberg. And so what is the role that data is playing in terms of philanthropy and, and kind of their interest in this work and, and how they're making decisions and, and their support? Um. So fascinated about Matt, what you're saying in terms of what, what, how that translates into what you do at the state and local level. We come back to that. Um, I think because um, we deep in what you're saying um, about the genome of jobs and how you get the vocabulary and make sure there's a clear path. But in a kind of crude way, I guess the thing that um, ultimately matters most is we look scour the country and the world looking at kind of what can make an impact. I think that the most important metric, which is not always available, is ultimately like linked to jobs and income. Um, and in the end, um, education is not, it's also about citizenship, but it's uh, heavily about economic opportunity. And I think we have um, very few mechanisms right now in the country that give really good data on links between education and programs and jobs and economic opportunity. I think there are some more building blocks in place. Um, but I think that you know, one of the things we're doing is potentially supporting some expensive <laughs> 
place by place building up of that. I think for systemically, if I were a policymaker, uh, I know some states have made some progress, I would try to make sure there's much more transparency in understandable fair ways about links between various kinds of educational programs and jobs and careers. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think that's actually a very actionable thing at a lot of state levels. I don't know if you have anything. You love data, so I know you. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I would just, I would just say that from um, the consumer side or the practitioner side, um, uh, data should mean everything. But making sure that it's the right data. Don't, don't consume data for data's sake. Know why you're looking at your data to inform your decision making, your policy making. That is essential and that's critical. There are a lot, there's a lot of noise out there. Uh, in some cases, there's too much noise. And for a practitioner, um, that can be overwhelming. And so being able to discern what uh, is most meaningful to drive your decision making um, is really the, the corner of all that we did here and still do here in Tennessee. The other piece is, is that I will say that too often, for government, um, we, we don't have all of the data needed. Either we are not acquiring it, or we don't know how to access it, or what we do um, uh, acquire is, is suspect. Uh, Self-reported data, for instance, for me is a suspect form of data. Uh, and so being able to, to again, discern the right data in order to inform the decision making is probably one of the hardest things to do, but the, the best thing to do for government. Great. All right, well, we're going to open it up to the audience for any questions. Post lunch, I know, it's rough. Um, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, hi, my name is David Moore, and, and my question is I guess I'd like a little bit more practical advice on the educator side. So maybe this is for even you, Kate, and Danielle, and, and John. The, you know, we know that CCR, college career readiness, has become another buzzword. It's become another shiny new thing, and it can have money attached to it. And we know from Florida's experiment with career courses and certifications is that when you put money into it, it got some really cool innovations, and it got some really bad things that got career slapped on the front of them. And that goes back 20, 30 years ago, right? So. It, it cuts both ways, right? It got us good stuff and it got us some really bad stuff, right? And so I worry about educators sort of seeing the shiny new thing and sort of slapping a name on a course, but never talking to a business leader or never looking at data. So I'm curious what advice you all would have around how you solved this or have seen it solved to help the educators come outside of their bubble into this universe, right? I'd be curious for more advice on that front. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start, and, I, and I, I love that question, and I appreciate it very much. Um, uh, it's, it's often where the tail is wagging the dog, and so the roots don't go deep into the ground as you're making these transformative decisions or programs, these initiatives, and so you do start to see the wheels that come off. Um, I, I will uh, uh, do a very quick plug, and this may be of help um, also, is that next week Excel and Ed will be releasing a first in a series of playbooks for policymakers. This one will be um, a kind of a, a, a broader look at how do you have a strong state CTE program, what does that mean, what are the questions you should be asking, uh, ways in which you should be going um, and kind of begin to tackle this. Uh, so that may serve well uh, in, this, in this conversation. Um, I, I co-wrote that with, a, with an individual here from Excel and Ed. Um, but I think the, the, the stronger pieces to your point is, is the, the, the right and informed decision making. The leaders um, who are charged with these responsibilities uh, have to have a strong understanding of what they are trying to achieve and how they to go after it. And how do they how do they be good stewards of the funding that does come uh, from them? Tennessee was uh, a very fortunate recipient of phase one and phase two NSFY grants, which were funded from J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, we were from day one exceedingly committed to to driving what what was necessary needed in the state of Tennessee and not have these weird one-offs where you're chasing shiny objects and you don't know where it comes back to roost. And so you have to have a strong core component of what you're trying to achieve and have everything around that go back to, to support that. Uh, that is not easy, and again, it takes, a, it takes leadership, it takes 
um, skill in focusing in on the things that matter most to your state and allow for that then to inform the decision making. But that's just, that's just my perspective. I mean, the thing I'll add is I think it's time to bring CT out of the shadows, yeah. right? I mean, I think that's a big piece of this is they got, no one paid attention to them. So on one hand, they did a lot of innovation. They got a, there was a lot of legacy that was allowable because no one was paying attention and because it was for those kids over there in the back of the hall. I love the Amazon example, and I've seen this in a lot of schools that are really putting CT first. Is they're putting it in the middle of their schools. They're putting it with glass walls. So everyone's walking by it and seeing the kids actually working with their, working their hands, actually applying, not sitting in a classroom, and it's making it a desirable choice. So part of that is changing that school culture, the state culture, I think principals and school leaders are actually gonna be your core component to getting the teachers to valuing this and wanting to be part of the system is if that culture is at the school level as well. I think part of making that cultural change is also about um, developing the culture of data. Um, if we are making, um, to your point, you know, there's significant risks in saying, hey, we're gonna go out and develop people toward careers. If those programs are not aligned to where the jobs are, not just broadly, but locally, um, then we have um, done significant harm. Right? There needs to be a Hippocratic Oath in the world of education to do no harm when we prepare students for jobs that don't exist, or we prepare them for jobs that, don't, that do exist, but without the skills it takes to get them, um, then we've done a lot of harm. How do you avoid that? Well, I think that's actually where data come in if you create the culture of analysis. Um, data can tell us very specifically what are the jobs that are in demand today, what are the jobs that, that will be in demand, and the skills, even more importantly, that will be in demand tomorrow, um, and um, how does that vary based on where we are versus the country at writ large. And so that kind of level of analysis needs to drive all kinds of program creation, uh, needs to drive pathway development, and, and um, needs to be an important litmus test for where, how do we align funding um, with programs. My super quick comment, um, kind of we have other questions, um, is employers. If I were, you know, what do educators need to do? I think in individuals, the schools, institutions, data have created a mechanism for employers in efficient ways, because employers are busy running businesses, but to um, better signal and help um, shape what happens in schools, not exclusively, um, but significantly. One very quick anecdote, we took some, we have a fellowship in um, Louisiana for some teachers from other states to learn about a change in the economy, changes in jobs. So a few weeks ago, I wasn't there, one of our team members told me they'd taken a bunch of the top educators from across Louisiana, um, especially in the Baton Rouge area, to a um, company which had um, pet P-Tech, Petrotech jobs available for basically 60K, 70K, 80K. Um, that required basically going through a community college degree program to get there, and to get there, some pretty decent math, literacy, science skills, the kind of the academic standards efforts in Tennessee and elsewhere are pushing. These teachers had no idea these jobs existed, none. And they had no idea actually what pathways might have been available to have their kids go to. And they had no idea what actually the skills coming out of high school were that would lead to literally jobs in their own backyard. And that's not the educators' fault. Like, the, systemically, we haven't made that available. So I think that finding effective, efficient ways, that's like an anecdote, but to have employer high demand jobs shape, not just narrowly, because employers are going to near term needs, it's more about the, what that signals for what is needed in the education system, I think is the number one, the number one thing needed. All right, so last question, we'll go quickly. Good, yes. All right. Hi, my name is Hal Speed with Computer Science for Texas and also with the, the Microbit Foundation. My question is mainly for you, Kate. You, Matt, I really enjoy the, the data and really foreshadowing where we see these digital skills are, are going to be in demand on the horizon. But what are we doing to update the career clusters and, and modernize them for all of these digital careers that are coming? That is a great question. So for the audience, there are 16 career clusters that were created about um, two decades ago. They're a little stagnant, and we are aware of that. Um, so fun fact, we actually have a task force that Danielle is convening for us, it's all in the family, right now to actually think about that, to really how do we make sure that um, honoring the work that's been done with the career clusters, which are really used in nearly every single state, and I think change the conversation from those handful of blue collar jobs to recognizing that CT can encompass the world of work but we know that they're, they need to be modernized for, to look forward. So that work is, is occurring right now. We're taking a deep dive to really get a sense of where they've been, how they've served, how they've changed the conversation around CT, but where we need to go in the future to really make them more modern and more flexible. So 
check back in six months and I will have a, a more answer. So I know we're like at time, but I did say we're gonna do rapid. So you each have, let's say, 20 seconds. And some of you have done advice, but advice and or caution. I'll let you pick which one you wanna do and then we'll close out. Um. This is where we really weren't ready for that, so we're all just trying to kick the can down the road here. Um, I think advice from, from my lens is that for those of you who are policymakers and those of you who are um, the ones who, who drive that marriage of education to, to support your, your communities and your state, is to, to be discerning, to be um, thoughtful in what it will require to get you there, and to be patient um, uh, so that, that would be um, an advice. Skills, not jobs. <laughs> Mine will be show the other end of the pipeline. I'll make a very, give a very, very quick anecdote. The most popular uh, uh, course in our program is CDL, commercial driver's license, like Sherry in the video. Most states, you can do it in uh, 10 weeks, two and a half months. At Amazon, we can often do the classroom portion within our buildings and then do the driving portion right outside in these big Amazon parking lots. What we found is that despite its popularity, people weren't leaving. What they needed to do was uh, know the landing spot that awaited them upon completion. So now we've got those pipelines set up. You know exactly the job you're going to before you start the course. It's made all the difference. Um, to me, I'll give a, uh, a little teaser for the Clay Christensen um, thing that's coming up um, that I have the privilege to moderate some questions of him after as I've been preparing for that. And I think his pay attention to his talk about um, um, what job you're hiring for, not a job in terms of a career job, but when you're kind of trying to sell something, what job a customer wants to, that to do for them, and consider how in this work, how we can both ensure that this is meeting the needs of employers on one hand, and what employers are looking for out of education, and on the other hand, how given what students and families really want, what motivates them, how to substantively do this and, and package this in a way that is deeply attractive to students and families, and finding that like that balance and that um, uh, in very concrete ways, whether it's through CT programs, apprenticeships, community colleges, uh, I think is key. Great. Um, well, please join me in thanking the panel, and thank you all. Thank you.